Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacob Wehrmaat. In case you weren't here in the morning, I am a software engineer at ChemConcept. I work during the days, uh, but during the night, I uh, like to develop uh, Linux. So, uh, therefore, my goal for today is to tell you a little bit about uh, capabilities in Linux. So, first of all, uh, in case you didn't know, uh, Helenos uh, is very portable. It runs on seven uh, processor architectures, starting with ARM, uh, going through Itanium, as was already mentioned by Yuri, uh, Spark, uh, RPC, um, uh, of course, MD64, maybe some others. Um, and it was designed and implemented from scratch. It was mostly written um, well, it was, it was written by us, so it doesn't contain any third-party code. It doesn't clone anything, so it does not look like uh, Linux or Windows. And uh, you wouldn't find uh, someone else's code in it, basically. Uh, we like to write it in a way so that um, there, is, there are no huge uh, monolithic components. So, for example, if you take a look, at our networking stack, uh, you will find uh, several components that create it that roughly correspond to the layers of the networking stack. Um, I would also like to deliver a short update uh, from the last uh, of them. So last year, uh, we made two releases, one in April, the second one in November. The, no the November uh, release uh, is the one in which we switched from Bazaar to GitHub, so you can go to, uh, sorry, to Git, so you can uh, go to GitHub and work us there. Uh, last year, we also had our regular hackathon event, which we call Helenos Camp. Uh, for me personally, it was a very uh, good experience because I saw a new energy uh, which uh, came into our project. Some of the topics that I will be talking about today uh, started there. And last but not least, uh, we now also have uh, a paid uh, developer who is paid by uh, CZNIC, which is the caretaker of the .CZ domain. They have a stand uh, very close to this room and are also famous for making the this Omnia router. Uh, as for things that uh, are ahead of us, that will be soon, hopefully, merged into Helenos, uh, there is a C++14 support, which will, or should be uh, ready sometime in February, and uh, a USB 3.0 uh, enhancement of our already existing USB stuff. Uh, what you can see on the picture is uh, is a laptop of one of uh, the USB 3.0 team members, uh, which is of course running Helenos and has uh, a flash disk attached uh, via the uh, XHCI controller and uh, some data is transferred from there. <coughs> so, so that was from uh, that was for the update and for what's coming next. Now, uh, before we delve into capabilities in Helenos. There is one more thing that I would like to mention, that's uh, Google Summer of Code. As you might know, uh, some of the projects uh, assembled in this dev room participated last year in Google Summer of Code. By the, by the way, uh, Google Summer of Code is uh, an internship uh, program for uh, university students. The students work on an open source project. Uh, there are some mentoring organizations that mentor uh, the students, and Google pays stipends to those projects, uh, to those students, sorry. Uh, so last year we participated, uh, there were three students, one for Hurt, one for Minix, and one for Redox. All of them were quite successful, and uh, this year we applied again. Uh, so uh, you can keep your fingers crossed for us on February 12th, when uh, the mentor organizations will be, will be announced by Google, and in case the micro kernel dev room is selected, then uh, students can start applying uh, starting from March 12. And in that case, uh, you can search for uh, this micro kernel dev room logo on Google Summer Code web pages. 
So that's for the agenda. And now capabilities. So this is, uh, this is how we uh, are used to talk about capabilities in HANOS. So for us, a capability is a task local reference to some kernel object. Uh, and kernel object, it's uh, basically a wrapper which is reference counted at po and points to a real thing, to something which lives in the kernel and is accessible to user space only via capability which is referred from user space using a handle. You can imagine the analogy uh, of uh, VFS files where you have a file handle which is the integer reference where you have in the kernel the table of open files which is basically an array of capabilities and uh, elements of this array then point to the, the underlying VFS object which would be the kernel object. Uh, what is the motivation for um, actually caring about uh, capabilities and Helenos and trying to bring them to Helenos? So over the years, because Helenos started in 2001, uh, so over the years we accumulated a certain amount of technical debt. Uh, and we also uh, haven't always known how to do things properly, so we need to fix, uh, fix those things. Uh, if we also want to do some more fancy stuff like virtualization, such as the one which was presented here last year for work, uh, we need to get rid of all uh, global identifiers or global names. And because uh, we have, I think it's on this side, uh, we have laptop stickers that say that uh, Helenos is an advanced microkernel system, I can't imagine going forwards without having capabilities actually. So it's also a matter of modernization. So uh, I would like to uh, present some uh, examples that illustrate the need for capability. So here is a real example. Uh, our goal is to pass an open file from a parent task to a child task. Both of them are clients of the DFS server. And how do we do that? So one possibility would be to go like this. Uh, what we see here. Uh, <coughs> It is the setup that I have just described. Uh, the VFS server um, contains a state which logically belongs to the parent and to the child task. It's the table of open files and it's per task. So it has an, a table for the, the orange task for the parent and it also has a table for the child. And the goal is to duplicate uh, this uh, basically uh, the object pointed by one entry in the open files table and duplicated in the child's uh, table. So, so now we are going to see an example of one of these uh, broken interfaces that we implemented. So what I did a couple of years ago uh, was something like, like this. You can see the whole process uh, involves seven steps uh, that uh, result in uh, in the child process receiving a capability. I will briefly walk you through it, I uh, won't spend too much time on it. So basically the parent starts by telling the child, hey child, now I'm going to send you a file. And immediately afterwards it says, and uh, now I'm using a kernel recognized uh, IPC call method, or IPC message method, IPC M state change authorized. And the child says, okay, and when it says, OK, uh, both of them identify um, the common server, the kernel notices the positive reply to this message and sends an IPC notification to the VFS server. The VFS server then proceeds to actually duplicate the actual entry in the parent's uh, open file table uh, and uh, creates a new entry in the child's table. Then uh, the process continues by the child querying the VFS server for the new handle and uh, the VFS server replies with the handle uh, with an affirmative reply and the child concludes the whole handshake by uh, replying to the original first message by the OK. So is there among you uh, someone who absolutely loves this approach? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, so, of course, uh, this is rather an example of how not to do things. Uh, I'm 
myself, I'm not 100% sure that uh, this mechanism, even though it's a generic mechanism which allows two clients of the same server to negotiate a change of this state, um, uh, I'm not myself convinced that it's actually safe and free uh, of some race conditions. Also, uh, there are two things to note about it. Uh, those VFS objects that live inside VFS are not real kernel objects. And basically, they all map to the one uh, IPC entry point that exists uh, in the VFS server. And second thing to note is the active role of, uh, of the VFS server and also the kernel which needs to some notification. Okay, so the bottom line is we don't like this. Should have probably never been implemented. And instead, uh, there is a different way how to do things, which is the capability way. So uh, instead, we now have uh, something like a table of open files, or if you will, a table of capabilities that is still associated with, with each of these tasks, but lives in the kernel and references some kernel objects that also live in the kernel. So, and now the exchange is quite easy. Imagine that the parent task uh, has a connection or has a way of talking to the child. Um, it can be concluded in two steps. Uh, first of which is the parent basically telling the child, um, please connect to me and identifying the object to which to connect. And uh, when the child positively response, uh, the kernel duplicates basically the connection to uh, the originally pointed uh, object and it's done. So uh, there is a mechanism uh, which lies in, the, uh, in an IPC message which is understood by the kernel called IPC M connect either to me or me too, depending on whether you want to connect to somebody or have somebody connected to you. So, so it's a mechanism for creating connections and callback connections. And uh, currently, uh, it does not accept the port number, so it wouldn't work that way in the current Helenos. Uh, there still needs to be something done in order for it to work like that in the future. Note how the VFS server is not involved any, anyhow in this transaction. And uh, we now have a different situation when each VFS file is represented by one kernel object. There is no, no more uh, the correspondence between one IPC endpoint in the VFS server and then some kind of uh, user space kept uh, VFS object. So that was for passing files. And there is another example which actually uh, there is now a fix for it in Helenos. So imagine a device driver. Device drivers usually need to register some kind of uh, interrupt handlers. And the question is how to properly identify the handler so that it can be referred to from user space and eventually uh, unregistered. So uh, before Helenos 0 0.7.1, uh, Helenos supported three, three syscalls. The first syscall, sysdevice assigned devnode, uh, was a syscall used to assign a device number, but it wasn't anything more than a syscall which, uh, which would routinely assign a number from a global pointer and then increment the pointer. Then uh, you could use this global identifier to subscribe your uh, interrupt handler, which in this case is referred to the, by the IRQ argument. And you could also use it to unsubscribe the same. Uh, now I wonder, can some of you spot some problems with this interface? There are a couple of problems, but I, I, I want you to think about it a little bit and uh, come up with some potential problems that you might see. <coughs> okay, Norman. <laughs> Yes, yes, the authorization for doing this operation, so it doesn't end Yes, yes, that's, one, yeah, that's definitely one of the issues. So, so uh, Norman asks uh, whether or he suggests there is no authorization for the components to do this. Uh, and okay, I, I won't hold this any longer. So, so there are a couple of problems. Um, 
So first of all, uh, microkernel should probably not be uh, assigning device numbers, uh, even in this stupid manner when it's a device number is basically a counter and doesn't really mean anything. But the more uh, serious problems were that uh, the API doesn't require the caller to actually use the, the return uh, identifier and instead the caller <coughs> can use any number of its choosing. <coughs> so for registration it can make up something of its own and even more serious for their registration it can deregister uh, interrupt handlers for an arbitrary uh, other uh, task. So the tasks can be tasks. Sorry? G that no is the same number in two tasks? Uh, it's global. It's a, uh, ah, the it's a really global. It's a, it's a really, it's okay. a global, uh, global ID. So, so as you probably will agree with me, this is completely broken. And uh, it was fixed in Helena's uh, 0.7.1 uh, when we introduced capabilities in base. So we got rid of uh, assigning the device numbers in the first place and then modified the API. So that now um, uh, the su subscribe uh, Cisco returns capability, which can be used by unsubscribe. So it's no longer possible for unsubscribe to unsubscribe something else, uh, of, and that belongs to someone else. Of course, it can unsubscribe a different uh, IRQ handler from the same task. <coughs> so if you can agree that. Uh, capabilities are great and everybody loves them, how do we introduce them to Helenos? And the question is that we don't have to do that uh, because they are in a way already there, but that way is quite limited as we will see. So now here is a picture of the basic Helenos uh, IBC communication between uh, two tasks. So, uh, so in this kind of pink oval, um, I, uh, I put all the state which exists in the kernel. Uh, we have two tasks. The orange one is the one which starts the communication. It has a set of phones which are basically connections. Uh, some of the phones are connected to other objects that are called answer boxes. The answer box is basically a message queue. Uh, and uh, so, um, where to begin? So, so the orange task can basically specify the connection by a handle, user space handle, in this case 2, 0, 1, 2, uh, which to use then specify some arguments of the message. Uh, so the handle identifies the phone, the phone uh, identifies the answer box. Then the receiving task uh, can use a syscall to actually wait for messages on the answer box and gets, uh, gets the call, basically receives the call, which is identified by so-called call ID. And we will get to call IDs later. And then it has one of two options. It can answer the call using the call ID and some return arguments, in which case the call goes back to the answer box of the sending task, from where it can be again waited for by the original sender, which concludes the loop and the sender gets a reply to its own message. But uh, the recipient doesn't have to answer. It can do uh, a different thing. It can also forward the call uh, to someone else. So now we have three tasks. So here we, here we see that, uh, as I've said, uh, the blue task is not directly replying, but it's forwarding the message using some of its own IPC connections. In this case, number five, so it's this one. This one is connected to the answer box of the green task. And again, the green task uh, can either decide to forward the message uh, farther or it can reply. Uh, what is important here is that the reply goes to the answer box of the uh, original sender. Uh, now, uh, how do we create new, new connections in Helenos? So uh, you need to use a dedicated method, which is understood by the kernel. and uh, Basically, if you um, if if a task replies in an affirmative way to this uh, to this call, the kernel notices it and creates a connection between the two tasks. So the sender was the orange task, the, re the, the recipient is the green task. Uh, the kernel notices it and creates a new phone connected from the orange phone to the 
between answer box. It can also uh, kind of the direction can go uh, the other way. So instead of using IPCM connect me to, I can say IPCM connect to me. In which case the arrow would go like this. So um, there will be a new connection created from the task which replies to the answer box of the original sender. This was important uh, to actually realize that Helenos uh, contains a coarse grain capability system which is in its IPC. My claim is that this IPC is roughly analogous uh, to the MAC IPC, uh, even though there are some limitations that we should see. So here is a little table uh, which kind of maps the analogies from MAC to Helenos and uh, vice versa. So the unit of communication in Mac is a message and a call in Helenos. Uh, a IPC communication endpoint is called port in Mac, answer box in Helenos. Uh, the connection is represented by a send write in Mac, where, while it is called phone in Helenos. Uh, the <coughs> receiving from an IPC endpoint can be done if you have a receive write in Mac and is uh, implicitly allowed to be owning task uh, to, the, to the task which wants to receive from its own answer box. So it's implicitly allowed. Uh, in order to answer or to reply to a message in Mac, you need to have uh, send write to some port which accepts uh, the reply. And in Helenos, uh, you need to have the call ID of the uh, accepted call. And of course, this is something that Samuel from, uh, from the board, uh, project was mentioning today. In Mac, there is a way to actually pass a send write to a third party. So if there is a name service task and has connections, has send writes to some other clients, it can uh, give such a connection to uh, whoever inquires for it. And the same, th the same effect is achieved in Helenos by forwarding IPC connections, as we've seen in the previous slides. So the bottom line of this is that in Helenos, uh, a capability corresponds to a phone, and uh, in order to pass the capability, we need to forward a connection. Now, what are the limits? Because I said it's analogous to a Mac, but it, uh, it has limitations. So uh, the limitations of the state which existed uh, like a year ago is that uh, phones were the only types of capability. There were no other objects that were somehow uh, usable with this. And it was only possible to pass one capability, which is like the APC connection. Uh, there was only one answer box uh, possible per task, which is different from Mac, uh, which can have uh, multiple ports uh, owned by a task. And there were some hard limits. So there, there was, for example, a limit of, si of 64, pay, uh, 64 uh, uh, phones per task. And there was one especially annoying thing, uh, which is the last one, uh, that those call IDs, those are the numbers that in user space identify a call either to reply or to forward, were actually leaked kernel addresses. Because frankly, can there be a better user identifier than a leaked kernel address? Uh, sure, there can be, and we, we will see. Uh, we will see what it is. Uh, on this picture, um, which I try to uh, draw, uh, we actually uh, see that there is some kind of granularity problem uh, because of the existence of the single answer box. So even though uh, we have a couple of objects that exist in the user space context of, of uh, the server. Uh, we only have uh, one answer box, which somehow needs to be mapped on those uh, uh, user space objects. And uh, this was done by the libraries in Helenos. <coughs> so this is, this is the past state. Now, uh, what we have now, uh, the situation has changed slightly because we implemented a new capability for more. And, uh, started with uh, making IPC work with it. So IPC is now implemented on top of this framework. We also introduced uh, two new kernel object types. So one for calls, 
so that we don't we no longer refer to calls uh, using uh, kernel addresses, but we have proper uh, capabilities that identify a kernel object uh, for each call. And also, uh, as was apparent from one of the examples, we now have capabilities for, for IR, IR view objects. Um, unfortunately, we still have only one answer box per task, so we haven't fixed that yet. <coughs> but um, we will probably uh, fix that very soon. On, on the picture, which is uh, at the bottom here, you can see the general uh, structure of the, uh, the capability framework, so the orange ovals, they represent the cup underbar, uh, underbar T types, which are the actual capabilities, so if the capability is in a published state, it is visible from user space under a handle, in this case 5 or 13, and also there is an owner of this capability, which is a task called A. Uh, capability objects, they point to k-object on the part T, which contains a reference count and a type, and points to the underlying raw object, in this case, it is the call on the part T. And apart from references to the k-object uh, from the k on the part T structures, there might also be references from the code. So that's the reason why we have three and not two here. Um, related to having only one answer box, we still, in this current situation, need to use the capability which, is, uh, which points to the phone and a global number which identifies the service or the object in the, in the server. And so uh, it's slightly better than it used to be a year ago, but it's still not good enough. And we would like to have something like that. So on this picture, you already see that we got rid of the limitation of one answer box per uh, task. And now we have as many as there are these uh, library entities that were previously mapped to the single answer box. So and with that is related the fact that now it is sufficient to use only the capability handle in order to refer to the respective destination object. And, uh, uh, so, okay, uh, so there will be some correspondence between the uh, C library uh, async ports and uh, the actual answer boxes. There will be a new capability type for them. If we do that, we could actually get rid of uh, the phone objects at all, because now they will become somewhat redundant. Because, um, depending on the capability right, it will be either possible to make use of uh, the answer box capability to send messages or to use uh, an answer box capability to receive messages. So I think we won't need phones uh, when this is done. And uh, because even if we do this, uh, there will still be two more objects that uh, use global IDs in LNOS and that's threads and task IDs. Currently, these objects uh, have global identifiers, and whenever an API works with, uh, uh, works with first or uh, tasks, it needs to pass this identifier, and the kernel needs to look up um, and, and make sure that such an object exists, and this won't be necessary if we also, um, if we also make it possible to refer to these objects by capabilities. So um, the previous slide uh, said what needs to be done uh, in order for me to be satisfied with the situation, but uh, uh, there is more to come and more what needs to be done. So we will need to seriously think about resource uh, management because along the course of making uh, these adaptations, I removed uh, some hard limits. So for, exam for example, the limit on 64 uh, capabilities per task is gone. Now there is a hash table and it's possible to actually have unlimited number of capabilities. So um, now it's uh, possible for a task to actually consume so much memory that the system becomes, uh, becomes unusable. 
uh, a similar situation is that I removed a limit which was there for the number of unanswered <coughs> calls sent over one phone. So in the old Helenos it wasn't possible to send more than four. If you send the fifth, the kernel would block such an attempt. And because this was contributing to some hard to debug deadlocks, I removed it and instead uh, decided that uh, we can uh, somehow defer the problem to the resource allocator. So if instead each task has some resource pool, uh, this, these limits can be basically enforced by the virtue of the task running, running out of its resource pool. So it, can, it will be allowed for a task to have as many active calls or as many capabilities as its memory allows it to have. So, so we will most likely introduce resource pools and uh, I'm thinking of uh, a resource trading scheme which would be probably very similar to the one which is uh, presented in Gnode. Uh, so whenever, uh, whenever a task uh, requests another task for a service, such uh, a request would have to be accompanied by some resources that the client pays uh, the server actually with to do the, the actual work. Then I have some minor things uh, that we don't currently need or use, but might uh, seem to be useful or even needed in the future. So for example, we don't distinguish between different capability rights. Uh, at this point, all capabilities are equal that point to the same object, but uh, as I illustrated on the example of, uh, of the answer box capability that could be both used for sending and receiving, we might need to introduce uh, something like capability rights. Currently, there is also no way uh, uh, to revoke an existing capability, so we might introduce that if, if that's needed. And uh, we are still able to pass only uh, an IPC connection, even though we have capabilities for other kinds of objects. Uh, this might be actually, this limitation might be actually removed uh, when we have uh, capabilities for tasks, because now uh, it's not even possible to specify a task using a capability, but if it is, we can specify a task via a capability and uh, another capability which should be duplicated in the new task, and that could be a, a new or alternative mechanism for passing capabilities between tasks in Helenos. Or we can do uh, a similar thing for IPC and li uh, relax a little bit the requirement that the past object is an IPC connection and that uh, IPC and connect to me handshake. So, um, in summary, uh, I wanted to say today that uh, um, even though we, we hadn't known about it, uh, there, there was a capability system in Helenos indeed, uh, which was there basically by chance. I asked the developer uh, who, who created IPC for Helenos whether he intended it or not, and whether he was uh, familiar with the Mac approach, and he said that uh, he basically declined, uh, except that he didn't intend to make a capability system and wasn't even aware of the fact that it's a coarse-grained limited capability system. Uh, and anyway, we took this foundation and uh, extended it uh, so that it's more generic and contains more capability, uh, capability types and kernel objects to the point in which we were able to fix some of our broken APIs, uh, fixes for some other cases like the one with, pass, uh, with passing BFS handles still needs to wait until uh, we can have multiple answer boxes per task. And uh, all this stuff is still quite new, uh, is a little bit still in the flux, so there might be some time uh, required for it to settle down and stabilize, so things still might change a little bit. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. There's a question. Yes.
So you mentioned that capabilities have an order which you task, right? A few, a few slides ago. Yes. Um, I'm trying to determine the semantics of that. Uh, what does that mean exactly that the owner is task A? Yeah. Uh, so, so you have to. You basically need to think about this as a magnified version of this. And capabilities, literally speaking, are objects that uh, exist in the context that uh, belong, that are task local. So, so it's basically a reference. Um, let's pick one. So for example, number four is a task local name for this P or this kernel object. And it, it exists here. So it, when I, you say it belongs to task A, task A is the local. I'm trying to understand whether it's the issuer or the receiver. Um, uh, well, it, uh, so, so the question the question was uh, who is the owner of the capability, um, right? Yes. Well, every task every task has a set of its capabilities, and they might be associated with some kernel of. <coughs> okay. And it might be possible uh, on on these examples. Uh, I don't think there was a case in which one, actually on the last example, if, right. I, if I switch here. Can you rephrase the question? Maybe make it simpler to answer? Yeah, yeah just let, let me finish. Okay. Uh, so here we have an instance of a kernel object which is referenced by two capabilities. One of them is in the orange task and the other one is somewhere here in the blue task. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so there are two capabilities that point to the same kernel object and both of them are in different tasks. Yes, and that's the task in your data structure. Well, this was just uh, an example, uh, so this yes, is but that, 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 that's a field in your task. In your yeah, data there is structure. there is because uh, these uh, entities are in a hash table, and the task uh, uh, so so they belong to a task, and there is a hash table. But uh, so so they belong to the task by virtue of being in that task's hash table of capabilities. So it's the opposite. I mean, there are at least two ways to do it. Yeah, there are probably many ways to do this. Norman, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, so this is a quite fundamental change, at least it looks like this. Um, how much does the impact on your uh, user network force to the So what is the uh, triggering a rewrite of sort of putting part of the code or could you maintain API compatibility? So there is a question about the impact on the existing code, whether we had to rewrite lots of code. And the answer is uh, no, because uh, uh, we did that uh, slowly and gradually. So we first converted the IPC framework to, to be using this new capability stuff and preserve uh, the functionality which was there. Uh, in fact, uh, we are still removing some weird uh, uh, kind of reminders of, uh, of the old system. So we are still cleaning up. Um, and uh, the other changes uh, such as uh, removing the kernel addresses for uh, call IDs that was quite uh, straightforward and uh, I just have to ask uh, have to change, uh, fix only a couple of places. Of course, it takes some debugging and some development, but we are now talking about the order of like uh, a couple of evenings, basically. But uh, this reminds me something that I didn't mention. Uh, when we will be able to have multiple, uh, multiple answer boxes per task, it will naturally lead to a more object-oriented way of programming. So uh, we will lose uh, this uh, uh, granularity problem, and it might change actually the way how we write or how we look at uh, our servers. But but so far the changes were contained to the to the libraries, to the common libraries in Visual Space, not to the, the there was no major changes in the servers and right? Yes, and so Martin said that uh, these changes were confined to the kernel and the libraries and uh, there are no no other changes in the servers. So that's, that's true. Um, okay. It's a follow-up to the previous one. You have the capability to say, I mean, you, you can have the capability to mention 
task A can send a message to task B, right? Yes, and uh, such a capability, uh, so, so the question is uh, if I have uh, a capability which allows a task A to send a message to task B. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, and what does it look like? And such a capability is, uh, so we can take this example. So there will be, in this orange task, there will be capability under the handle for. It points to this capability, which kind of has also a label for in it. And it points to this kernel object, which is called, uh, which is the phone, that's the IPC phone, uh, which represents IPC connections, basically. And this phone is connected to this answer box, which is another kernel so object. The blue one is B. Um, oh, I, I see. Uh, you are trying to match uh, the. You are, you are trying to find the tasks that are. Oh, no, so this was just. I just made up the identifier here. Okay. This picture existed before I drew this one. So, the <laughs> so uh, just disregard this A. It's a, it's something that can can be, but it's not necessarily the same numbering as exists here. So I'm actually trying to match this with a problem I encountered when I prototyped. Capability system, which was I had difficulties um, with the uh, what basically the impose of potential race conditions with processes that were tasks dying on both sides and who was pointing to what and things like that. I don't know I that. Well, um, I'm trying to understand what, if you have what, the same what, problem as me or if you actually need to do the answer. So but the question is, maybe I should ask that. Sometime. Maybe you can take it offline, but uh, let me deal with this. So the question is whether there can be such a situation when I somehow lose track of uh, what capability points to what. So uh, the the user space uh, part of the task can of course forget what its capability capability handles are. Is the same. You can have. Uh, a set of open files, and you can completely forget uh, like which one is which, right? So this can also happen to you. But uh, since um, uh, the kernel objects are reference counted, and when the task is killed, it actually uh, cleans up its capabilities. It will result in uh, uh, kind of decreasing the reference counter, and when reference counter in the key, the kernel object, which is not owned by a specific task, drops down to zero, such an object is automatically destroyed. So you don't, you don't have to uh, really care about freeing capabilities because those will be free when the task is killed. So I left yeah. more of that. So do you have any more questions? Uh, so the question is what happens when the server dies and I hold a capability to the server's answer box and um, this is not actually specific to the new code because such a problem already existed uh, before um, uh, I, have, I think the phone got, uh, got slammed and is marked as uh, basically a dangling, uh, dangling thing so that when you attempt to actually send uh, a call over it, you will immediately uh, get an error message. And there is another, there is like a symmetric issue which is what happens when the client uh, disconnects and in that case there will be a hang up uh, call which is sent to the answer box. Well, again, basically, it could be it could be related to closing TCP connection. In ca in the case there are no further questions, uh, I thank you once again for your attention.